Thank you. Hello. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Dvir, as, uh, as mentioned, and um, I'm uh, working at Redis Labs, um, and I'm, again, going to speak about a bunch of interesting stuff we've been uh, experimenting with, uh, yeah, with regards to integrating Spark, machine learning, and serving uh, machine learning models uh, over it. So here we go. Um, just uh, a quick uh, introduction. Um, Redis, uh, huh, someone got the icons wrong. Uh, Redis Labs is uh, a commercial company that's behind Redis that is an open source in-memory database um, that's, uh, you probably know it. Uh, actually, let's see a show of hands. Who here is using Redis for something or has used Redis? All right, not bad. You see, so it's pretty popular, those of you who haven't. Um, so, uh, company started uh, disconnected actually from the open source project, but just uh, providing um, a commercial version of it. And uh, Salvatore Sanfilippo, uh, the author of Redis, has joined us a couple of years ago. And um, so, we're actually now uh, behind uh, the company, is actually behind the open source project. Um, we, we have a, a suite of, pro of products that starts from a cloud offering of Redis to a private cloud, uh, on-prem servers, um, uh, including flash storage of Redis uh, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Although, you know, still most of the usage of Redis is open source and we're fine with that. We're contributing a lot of uh, what we're doing out in the open. What you're about to see is completely open source as well, so you can go and download everything from GitHub uh, and just play with it. Um, so Redis, a uh, quick uh, overview, overview crash course, started uh, almost uh, nine years ago by Salvatore Sanfilippo, a very smart guy working out of his home in uh, Sicily. Still, by the way, most of the development of the open source core of Redis is done by this one guy, which is actually quite remarkable to be one of the top 10 databases uh, in the world, one of the leading open source projects in the world. And still, you know, one guy is still very, very passionate about it, still develops it uh, day in, day out, just like grinding and improving it and adding uh, interesting stuff to it. I don't know if I would have uh, withstood that for so long, but he's really is a character, really amazing guy. Um, and again, what you have to remember about Redis is that even though it's in memory, uh, it's, it does, that doesn't mean that your data is like ephemeral or, uh, or unsafe or whatever. Um, you can uh, use it purely as an in-memory store, but you can also uh, back things up in real time. Uh, to disk and have like uh, uh, pretty strong durability uh, uh, durability settings, uh, just like any other database. You have a transaction log sync to disk, whatever. So, just th these are the things to keep in mind. Uh, again, uh, Redis is used everywhere. I don't need to go uh, too deeply into that. Uh, from Twitter to Netflix uh, and like virtually every company that you can name uh, is using Redis for something. Uh, the differ the difference differentiators of Redis are, uh, first of all, performance. That's the one thing you need to keep in mind regarding Redis. It's super fucking fast um, in compared to other databases because, you know, it's written in optimized C and it's in memory and it's pretty simple. Um, and again, the simplicity means that it, it's kind of like, uh, I call it a Lego brick set for, for databases. It's not a database per se, but you can take all those data structures that it holds and b model your own solution for data uh, based on, uh, on all those components. And uh, it's extensible because the latest version of Redis 4.0 uh, supports modules, which we'll expand on <laughs> during this entire talk. Um, and uh, you can do some pretty interesting stuff now with Redis. You're not limited to the internal data structures of Redis anymore. You can do anything, which opens up some pretty interesting opportunities. Um, so Redis, let's go over the, the data structures, the vanilla Redis data structures that we have. We start with strings that are not just strings. You can manipulate uh, individual bits uh, and use that as a, as a bit field. Uh, or just as bitmaps or whatever. It has hash tables. So if Redis is one big hash table, this, 
keys themselves can be uh, actually even bigger hash tables or smaller, whatever you want. You can have fields that are actually embedded hash tables. Uh, and no, they can't have fields that are hash tables. That's where the, you know, it's not uh, turtles all the way down. Uh, keys can be a linked list or sets uh, or sorted sets, which are sets where every element has a score and you can get scored ranges. Uh, it, it can have geosets, which are sets where every element has uh, coordinates, and you can have radius searches and ranges. Um, interestingly, internally, it's based on a sorted set uh, and geohashing, but that's not in the scope of this talk. And hyperlog log, which is a, a probabilistic uh, data structure for uh, cardinality estimation as a fraction of the, uh, of the actual uh, size of the set you're estimating. So this is vanilla Redis, okay? Um, a very, very simple example of like the basic API of Redis, you can set strings and you can get their value, and that's like the, the core of Redis. Uh, slightly more interesting example uh, is hash tables. So there's a command called HM set, hash table, multiple set. Our key is spark hash, and then we have like pairs of keys and values. So org equals Apache, and version equals uh, 211. Uh, and then uh, if we want to get just one element, the version, we can get it, or we can get h get all, get all elements from a hash table, get all the elements from that hash table. So this is like the Redis API. There's a CLI app that you can use, or libraries in every uh, conceivable language uh, that you can just go ahead and use. Um, sorted set, again, it's a set where each element has a score, so if we push a bunch of elements with their scores, we can now get a range that is sorted, um, we can filter ranges by scores um, and do other interesting stuff. Um, pretty versatile. But again, all this is just vanilla Redis. And now comes the more interesting part, which is Redis modules. So um, for years, uh, the community has been pushing for more data structures and more commands and more features in Redis. And um, Salvatore has been pretty resistant to that. Uh, he doesn't want too much feature creep. He doesn't want uh, too much complexity and too much features. Redis already has like nearly 200 commands. It's a lot. Uh, you've seen just a fraction of the API in this short demo. So uh, eventually what, uh, what was agreed on was that Redis is going to support modules. And it gives uh, an isolated API and ABI to dynamic libraries to, to basically implement new data structures and new commands and add new features to Redis uh, without, uh, without uh, messing with the internals. And uh, the isolated API and ABI is like the core part of it because what it means is that Redis can change its internals and, uh, and break things internally, but the API and the ABI are stable, which means that you can compile your module that's been written to Redis 4.0 in Redis, Redis 5.0, which will be out, I don't know, in two years. Uh, and, or just load your old module into newer versions of Redis and it's guaranteed to continue working. So that's really important uh, uh, to understand in this context. So, but basically, in the end, we create, an, uh, we create a library in C or C++ or any language that has bindings to it. I've seen people use uh, Rust. I personally used Go. Uh, Rust works better for this, by the way. Uh, and, and you can basically extend Redis. I'm, my favorite uh, extension language is C, but again, it's not a must. It can be any language with C bindings. So uh, over at Redis Labs uh, and in the community at large, uh, we started uh, an effort to develop modules that extend Redis into directions that Redis itself uh, didn't go to uh, on its own. So uh, one of them uh, is Neural Redis, actually developed by Salvatore himself as like the, you know, the canonical example of how to develop a model, uh, module. Uh, it's a simple, fully connected neural network um, built, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it deep learning, but you know, uh, someone with, with more hyperverse might 
Uh, and it does, it's, it, the cool thing about it is that it does the evaluation uh, like uh, pseudo online. It has like uh, two models and it just like swaps them whenever it sees new input. But since it's like a small fully connected network, it usually converges within a second. So uh, you get the effect of pushing, uh, pushing examples at the network and it's gradually improving and you don't have to do like batch training and then, uh, and then evaluation. Redis ML, uh, which is basically a machine learning model serving module, which we'll discuss in this talk. Uh, Redis Search, my personal baby. Um, uh, search engine, scalable search engine, uh, very fast and very uh, interesting that's uh, implemented on top of Redis. Rejson, a data store uh, over Redis, a graph database uh, using Cypher and the time series module, and many other smaller ones or community ones, but these are like the ones that we develop at Redis Labs. Uh, so let's talk about a bit, uh, talk about uh, Redis ML for a while. So uh, the concept is a machine learning model server, which means that uh, basically we want to be a database for models, not for the training part, but just solving the last mile. Okay, you have a model, what do you do now? How do you serve that to the users efficiently and cheaply? Uh, so, you know, um, machine learning is becoming, is becoming more advanced, more ubiquitous. We're putting, doing more stuff with it, and, and the models are becoming bigger and more complex. And even though, you know, most of the research on, on machine learning and its engineering focuses mostly on, on the training part, like if you go and Google, you know, uh, machine learning model optimization or benchmarks or whatever, you're usually uh, finding papers on, on optimizing the, the training part, not so much on the, on the serving part. Uh, but you know, just the fact that it feels like a solved problem and a pretty trivial one, you know, eventually it's not, because um, you need to deploy and maintain and swap the models and, and take care of HA and take care of network and everything like, everything, uh, uh, in, in this sense, and you know, it just becomes, uh, becomes a burden, even though I agree that it's less of an interesting problem than you know, optimizing uh, uh, processing ImageNet over GPUs. You know? um, so scaling uh, machine learning models to serve is, is, can be expensive and a pain to do. Uh, so if we look like a, a traditional uh, Spark machine learning end-to-end -end flow, so we start with, with the data loaded to Spark and we do the training, that's fine. Now what do we do with the, with the output? Basically we have two options. We can just save the model to some Parquet file or whatever, or a database, and then create our own custom server, load that data there, keep that in memory, and uh, create an API, uh, make sure that our client's talking to this API, document this API, uh, and take care of HA, take care of uh, loading the model when it changes, et cetera, et cetera. And then the client app can talk to this custom server. The other option, which I think in most cases people, people choose, is to do just continue and do batch evaluation per user or per group that we want, right? So, um, and then save that to wherever, it doesn't matter. People actually use Redis uh, quite a lot for this case. Uh, but the problem here is that you need to pre-calculate stuff, and a lot of stuff. Uh, last company I worked for, we had um, millions of users, and we actually had this huge flow. We did batch evaluation, and just trying to figure out who is really active and we should calculate the models for, and who isn't, and what happens if there, if there is not a pre-calculated prediction for a user. That's, we had like a whole team working just on that, and that's a pain as well. Uh, so this is, the, this is what Redis ML enables. So you take your data, you train in Spark, just the same, no difference. But instead of doing anything further with it, you just push it into Redis ML, which is, uh, you can look at it as a model database, okay? Uh, and you can, by the way, even though we've created an integration of Redis ML with Spark, that doesn't mean you have to use it with Spark. Um, you can use it with other uh, libraries, it's just an API. Uh, so you can do the training elsewhere. And then simply the client app just talks to Redis ML and it does the classification, the evaluation of the model 
uh, online, uh, by online I mean uh, in real time as you serve the data very, very fast, so you, there's no need to do uh, batch pre-processing and there's also no need to create your own infrastructure to serve this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so again, we call that a hot model. Redis, again, remember, it's a data structure server, and it's modular. So we, the first model we've created is, uh, is uh, random forest. So basically, the decision trees are saved as decision trees in Redis. It's not like a representation of them, a serialization of them. No, it's actual trees in memory and an evaluator as a command. Um, so again, you can use Redis as... You, the, the evaluation is, f is fast, but you're also getting for free. Redis has replication and persistence and HA solutions and client libraries and clustering and sharding and monitoring tools and the commercial companies that support it. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe you've heard of one. Uh, and you get all that for free. Uh, and uh, you don't have to take care of all the, all the crap of engineering, uh, the, uh, engineering the, how to get to the last mile to the user. Uh, with, uh, with your models. Uh, so currently, uh, Redis ML, um, I would call it far from complete. So we have uh, tree ensembles, uh, linear regression, logistic regression, uh, lower level uh, metrics operation, which you can actually use to model uh, other you know, SVMs or whatever, just using a lower level API. Um, we're, the, the tree ensembles we've implemented ourselves but uh, uh, the metrics and uh, vector operations are just, uh, I think, atlas binding. Um, and basically, you know, we're gaining uh, the performance of well-tuned BLAST libraries that you can just use inside your database. And we're adding more. We plan to add uh, neural networks to it and other models to it. Um, so uh, just a quick recap. I, Probably for this room, you all know uh, Random Forest <laughs> better than I do, but you know, uh, let's, we're going to, to demonstrate Random Forest. So uh, Random Forest is a collection of decision trees uh, that can give us uh, classification and regression. In each tree, we have splitter nodes that um, help us make a classification de decision, which can be categorical or numerical based on input uh, features. Uh, and then we do like a majority vote uh, between the decision trees. And the, the, again, the hard part here is training them and building all the trees and selecting the features and all that. But uh, once you have the tree, it's pretty basic. Um, so an example here is uh, the Titanic uh, from the Titanic uh, prediction data set. Uh, we, we can try to predict if, uh, if someone uh, would die. So if uh, the guy is uh, male, uh, if uh, he's male and his age is under 9.5, uh, and again, he has siblings or spouses. You can predict from all those features. This tree can predict whether someone lives or dies. Uh, so you shuffle around the features, and you make a majority vote. Um, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, Leonardo's uh, character, you vote on whether we, he will die based on all the features that he has. Uh, you, you make a majority vote. In this, in this case, his features is male, 34, married, plus two, whatever. Uh, so one tree says uh, he survived, another said that he died, another said that he survived. Uh, so, the, so the decision is that he survived. Uh, so this is how random forests work, basically. I hope uh, this is correct. <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Um, so, uh, so this is basically what you do, okay? You, you need to evaluate all those trees based on a feature vector and, and do that fast. So again, in Redis, we just store all those trees uh, in memory and can evaluate them very, very fast. Um, so here is the API example. We load the module into Redis. The modules can be loaded in runtime using this command, or more preferably, uh, you can just tune the configuration file of Redis to load the module. Uh, and then you add, uh, you add the, you create a forest. And then you add uh, nodes to it with, uh, with uh, certain uh, decision points um, and, and their outcome. Uh, and then again, you can, uh, this one just evaluates one feature and then you can run the forest. Uh, and it has one tree and one feature. You can run the forest against the feature vector and get the classification. Um, and again, against another feature and get another classification. Now extend that to many, to many trees, many forests, many features, and you can see where this is going. 
Um, this is how you do it with Spark. Forget about the imports. Uh, Jedis is a, is a popular open source client for Redis. You just initialize that. Uh, here you just uh, create a forest. All oh, this is like Spark. Uh, pretty basic Spark stuff. We forked Spark uh, to be able to better integrate, but it's like the training process is similar, is identical. Uh, you, you train your uh, uh, your forest, and then you just load that module into into uh, Redis instead of saving it into wherever. Um, and then you just send the command uh, forest run, uh, name of the forest, and uh, an input vector, and and get sorry, and get uh, uh, the the classification from it. So as you can see, pretty basic. As long as you know you're reading your data, you're uh, training, all that remains the same. What changes is just the persistence into, uh, into Spark, into Redis from Spark. Um, so if, let's talk about the real world challenge here. Uh, we, ha we are an ad serving company. We need to serve uh, uh, ads at under uh, 50 milliseconds. Uh, we run 1,000 campaigns. Each campaign has a random forest. This is actually a real world example from a company that we've talked to. Uh, each one has 15K trees. Uh, and, and at average seven uh, levels per tree, uh, that would require like a thousand, uh, a thousand nodes to do that distributed, um, and, uh, and that's pretty expensive. Uh, but Redis does the classification very, very fast. Um, we've benchmarked it to be like 40 times faster than the classification of, uh, of SparkML. Uh, even, of, of course, this is discounting actually loading the module, just repeatedly evaluating new feature vectors. So even compared to like batch evaluation, this is like an order of magnitude faster. So uh, if you think that maybe uh, 100 milliseconds is, uh, is not acceptable, then you know you have something uh, 40 times faster than that. Um, so because again, it's in highly optimized C, that's you know, using CPU cache and, and brand prediction and like optimizing uh, the crap out of the evaluation. Um, so, so this is the advantage that you get. And um, I have a more detailed real-world example that you can actually, uh, uh, we have uh, Docker repositories you can download and, uh, and play with it if you want. Uh, movie recommendations. So the idea is that we could take the group lens data set that's just like movies and user uh, rankings of them. Uh, we do the training of, uh, of a random forest with, uh, with Spark. We load that into Redis ML. Um, and then we can just use that. So the idea is this. We take the user features and <clears throat> we build a random forest per movie. And then when you want to get uh, recommendations for a user, you just run it against a bunch of movies and just rank that uh, by, the, by the class or the, the prediction that the classifier made. So uh, we're using uh, Python to just process the data, Spark for the training, uh, Redis for the classification, and everything is neatly packed uh, within Docker. Images, there's one image for Redis ML for the uh, prediction server, and one image for the, uh, for the version of Spark that we have uh, to run this thing. Um, so again, using the Dockers, uh, we have two Docker images. Uh, we don't have much time, so I'll skip that. Uh, you just download and extract the, the MovieLens uh, 100K data set, and uh, the data is basically just user features uh, and rankings and other uh, rankings of, user, of uh, movies that they made. So our classifier should just return for each movie uh, the expected rate, rating of, that the user would give it based on the feature vector that is you know, on the same space as all the feature vectors from the users we've trained on. Uh, so uh, we transform the data and, uh, and make that into a model uh, uh, for Spark. There's a Python script that you can uh, just uh, use to generate the data uh, and convert that to the desired format. Uh, and then you just train and load it uh, into Redis. Again, uh, you create a random forest classifier uh, train all that uh, we're using the, the Spark uh, API, uh, and then um, and then just uh, load that thing into Redis. Uh, that's basically it. And once you do that, you have a server with everything working and uh, already trained, uh, and now you can execute it in Redis. So this is a Python client example. Import Redis, configure it, whatever. 
um, you get a user profile that's basically a sorted set or a key, whatever, in, in Redis. It's basically just like features, you see? Um, and then uh, you just execute the command ml forest run against, for a specific movie uh, against this user profile and get the classification, the predicted rating that the user would, how much this user would like the, the movie. Um, and again, uh, Redis CLI, you can see that each uh, movie has its own key inside Redis and the user profile is there again. And same effect. Um, this is a performance comparison. Ooh, I'm over time. Uh, but as you can see, Redis takes less than a millisecond to classify that. Um, and Spark take, takes about 50 milliseconds. Uh, and it remains the same even if you uh, repeat those. Um, so um, you have also, uh, this is a Python example. Again, I don't have time, so I won't uh, go over that. And basically what you have is you predict for a bunch of movies and you just rank by it. So that's basically it. Um, and again, uh, the summary of it is if you want to easily serve the models and make it fast, uh, you can train on Spark, save to Redis, uh, and run your models. Uh, and again, we intend to add more models uh, in the future. So thank you very much. And if there is any questions, I will take them now. All right. There's time for a couple of questions. Anyone? All right. Thank you. All right. Your talk was very loud and clear. OK. All right, thank you very much. We'll, we'll get back in 10 minutes.